I was looking for a solution to the passwords problem. That's when I found the passwords fast hardware password manager. And it costs around 20 euros on Amazon. And I basically want to know how secure is this thing. So when you Google, you will find some stories about it. You find their official website, some marketing videos. But that's pretty, pretty much it. You don't find any real um, evaluation on the security, what threat model does it provide, for what is it good for, just some marketing blurb. But there is no security evaluation of the product. And that's what I'm gonna do in this video. So when the password fast password manager arrives, it comes with this uh, packaging. When you open it up, this is how the device looks. It also comes with the menu. And here are some claims on the packaging, which we will look at later. The manual basically explains you how the whole thing works. Then there is some um, hints to some of the security features. The maximum password length is 32 characters, which coincidentally is 256 bit, which is co coincidentally exactly the uh, AES key lengths they use. So that's gonna be fun. So let's get started. So when you first power on the device, it makes you create a password. I'm gonna use ABC. It will make you confirm the password. Then it makes you set up a security phrase, which according to the manual, is probably used as some kind of seed for the encryption, or maybe it's the initialization vector or something like that. So let's see. And once you do this, it says device is initialized, then you can enter your password entries. I'm just gonna use test, and then you enter the username. I'll use foo. Then you enter the password. And it's also 32 characters, the maximum password length. And then you have a password entry. You can search for this. For example, if I search for search for test, it will find it. And then you can look up your passwords that you saved in here. And then when you power off the device and power it on again, it will ask for the password that you initially set up. So the password is ABC, but I'm just gonna use something else. And let's see if they got some sort of brute force protection. The menu claims that after five wrong tries, there is a delay, some sort. Okay, now it says too many failed lockins, turning device off. Um, okay. It won't turn off. Okay, I guess that's the forced wait time that you have to sit through as an attacker in case you're doing brute forcing. So, yeah, one might think that's pretty efficient because an attacker now has tried five different passwords and he has to wait all this long time. Okay, well, while that's waiting, let's look up some information about this on the internet. Someone asked what crypto they use and basically 
they say that's the each entry password entry is encrypted with with AES 256 with CBC mode and the source of entropy is a user driven sort creation during device setup source of entropy I'm not sure whether they mean the IV or something else let's see if there's some more okay there doesn't seem to be much information about this lots of marketing but now we're going to get back to try and brute force the device and this time let's try something else we use one password try two three four but now we don't use the fifth password try but we just restart the device and this is now our fifth password try ah. so you can actually reset the timeout now I'm gonna try something else I'm gonna okay now we, we have this forced wait now getting out the battery restart it oh and now we break again so this isn't an efficient brute force protection so this means from all I can guess is that there is no secure element on the device itself which also means that the password you enter in this case ABC is actually used to encrypt everything that's on the device and that's not ideal and we'll have to see whether they even use a um, key derivation function or something like that or whether they use whatever you enter here directly as the AES key because it's 32 characters it's exactly the key length of AES that they claim to use so that doesn't make me very confident in the device itself now so, so far we've seen what the device can do we've seen that it doesn't have um, very good protection against brute forcing it so in case you lose the device um, an attacker can still brute force um, the password that you set on the device some some other devices for example um, a smart card they have a, a secure element actually this, this whole smart card is the secure element where there is logic inside the chip that limits the tries you have so and it's extremely hard to, to break this um, logic in the hardware itself. Here it's all only software limitations. So let's look at the other claims they have. No need to remember multiple passwords. Yeah, that's true. You can save up to 125 passwords on this. Uh, create stronger passwords. Okay. Well, yeah, it's no need to remember the passwords, but the problem is um, creating a strong password. Let's create a new password. Let's call this one. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So now I, I create the password and I enter something like this and then a number and then special character like that. Now that looks complicated, but is this really random? Is this really good quality password? I'm not sure about that. I'm not entirely sure. And also, while you don't have to remember it, you have to manually type this. And, and as you can, this is like, I'm not really sure. I mean, I mean there, there are other devices that uh, use USB a USB hit device where you push a button and it enters it via uh, emulating a USB keyboard and that, if that thing had that it was actually be much much more convenient but it doesn't have it then then the next claim is they use AES256 which is the standard approved by the NSA for encrypting top secret information 
only you can unlock. Well, while it's true that AES is um, approved by the NSA, I don't think they um, approve this kind of key derivation that is used in here. I'm, I'm not sure what it is that the key derivation is, but the problem is you have to manually enter the key and it's no brute force protected, so I don't think that the NSA would approve this. So it's, it's not just the algorithm you use, but also the way in which you use the actual algorithm and also where do you get your key from. So find passwords in seconds. Yes, it has a search function. All data is stored permanently in memory. Yes, we tried that. We took out the battery and the passwords were still there. Then it's great for seniors. I don't know whether they mean with seniors elderly people or like uh, high school seniors because for seniors the, the keys they're small and it's really they, they don't click the, these keys this is one one key this key the down down key actually clicks None of the others actually really click. Okay, so some of them do click slightly, but I, I suppose all keys are supposed to be like, like this key here. But they're not, they're, they're really flimsy. And if we... segue into the tear down, let's look beneath here. Yes, you can see that this is just plastic on a PCB. It's just plastic with a little conductive thing glued onto the plastic thing and when you um, press the plastic down the conductive material makes contact with the PCB and the circuit is then closed and such the key input is recognized. But not not really want, want to test this too much. I mean a hardware keyboard is really cool to have. I mean, there's other devices that have you enter your pin or whatever with little joysticks or other um, mechanisms which aren't really great. But I don't think this is really usable by, by seniors. Don't, don't get me wrong. Also, regarding the size, they, they claim, at least I've seen it on their Twitter feed, Here, they claim that you can put it inside your uh, wallet. The problem is, this is a credit card, and the size, it's bigger, and so it will, will not fit most wallets, because most wallets will fit exactly this enough, this bigger dimensions. So, let's tear this thing apart and look inside. Pretty nice, pretty decent. So, we'll place this here for safekeeping. Now, the screws. Pretty simple design. Let's break out the microscope. Okay, it's a Let me just get some screenshots of all the components. 
battery holder. Then we have RXTX. Okay, so let's research these. Let's see, okay, it doesn't find anything on that chip. Let's go to the company website. Yeah, give me all your malware. Got the Mini Pro hooked up here to this side clip, and now I'm trying to read this um, in circuit. Let's see whether that works. If not, we have to read it out later. Okay, that looks. Interesting, but it was it was way too quick, but so I can't can't really figure out what this data means and whether it's actually read correctly. So I will just um, have it reviewed later and see what we're gonna make all of it. What I'm gonna do next is solder some wires to this because there's some test points here then these um, UART pads over here and there's some test pads here and I will solder wires to all of this so we can hook it up and then see whether we get something on the your connection there. So I'll just cut some wires and then solder it. So I got the wires cut and I will now solder these test points on the front side. Now I put it all back together and first I'm gonna try the UART that we found here via the TO Tamper board and to, and to press the buttons I used this old uh, keypad from a Nintendo so, now that we boot the device up and we have no output via the serial, so let me try pressing some buttons. And these actually don't work. Anyway, let's try the tegulator Voltage is 3.0 then we're gonna do a 
a decode scan from 0 to 4 and let's go okay couldn't find anything so let's try with a bypass scan yes no I don't have any pins yet okay that, that's interesting let's do that again it seems like as if these pins are actually test pads for the keyboard which actually if I look this up would make sense because these are all connected to the keyboard so no quick success there now I'm gonna desolder the flash chip on the back and try to read it out via the mini pro Okay, it's not the cleanest desolder, but it'll do. So now that I have desoldered the chip, I can actually again try to read it out. Place it in there nicely. Connect the Mini Pro. And then read out the code. This now looks better than before. And here we see actual data. Or at least it looks better. And I think here we have the passwords, the test and the test. These are the two passwords that I stored in there. And in between there is gibberish, which is probably encrypted data. So the next thing I will do is sort of wires to the to the pads where this EEPROM was supposed to be and then connect it via an external connector so I can use the device to write different passwords in the memory, then dump it via the mini pro and then see um, whether I can somehow reverse engineer the encoding and see how exactly they encrypted with AES. I will now initialize the device with the above test data, device password all A's, security phrase all B's and then the entries as follows. And I will now dump the flash of a this way initialized device and then further analyze how the password is actually stored in the flash. So now I have dumped the flash of a total of four different device password, security phrase and entry combinations. And now we will analyze these different combinations. First, I will look at the layout of the first dump that I took. And as you can see, here are our descriptions. This was the C, then the F and the C with an A at the end. And between these descriptions, there's these parts here, which look like gibberish, which are most likely the username and the password, but these are encrypted. And if you see here, this is 64 byte. This could possibly be the username. And here we have 32 bytes, 
which can possibly be the password, which is 32 characters long. And here we also see something quite interesting. This is actually the test data one, in which the entry one and the entry three have almost ident identical um, data, except for the description of the entry three, it ends with an A instead of a C. You can see it here, the A at the end. And it's quite interesting that these entries, here this is the first entry, and this is the third entry, they're actually identical. Also the encrypted data is identical. Obviously this, the description isn't identical because the device doesn't allow um, two entries to have the same descriptions, hence I changed the last letter to an A here. But the encrypted part, which is as previously explained, likely the username and password, they're identical. This means that this encryption does not use a um, separate initialization vector for each um, entry to be encrypted. So they all use the same key and initialization vector. So if you ask a cryptographic expert, he will tell you that this is bad because usually what you should do is to generate a random initialization vector for each of these entries so that even if the content is the same, it gets encrypted to a different value. So here I can now as an attacker, if I find this device and dump the memory, I can see that this entry has the same username and the same password as this entry. And obviously if this doesn't have like, like CC, but this has, for example, bank, and this here has email, I know that this user's email account has the same um, username and password as the user's bank account. Realistically speaking, the information gained from this is very little, but from a cryptography point of view, you shouldn't be able to gain this information in a properly implemented um, crypto system. So at the beginning of the dump, you see that the first entry is actually not a password entry, but it is some sort of header. It is also interesting to see that the number here is two, while the number here is one, and the number of the next entry is one as well. So every password entry has the number one, while the header has the number two. If we now compare these, for example, we compare the first data dump that we took to the second data dump. Do we actually only take, let's say, the 30, 31st lines of this comparison? We see that the first test we took and the second test, which used the same um, device, pa device password and a security phrase, and also the, uh, the first entry is identical, they also are identical here in the dump, except for some numbers that change. For example, the second number here in this um, tag of each entry is different. And here are some other differences. But the rest in this header here remains the same and also in here remains the same. So this means that there is no additional randomization for the encryption, for example, to take a uh, randomized illustration vector or to have a data encryption key, which is then protected by the password that the user enters. No, the whole encryption key is derived directly from the device password and the security phrase. Next, we compare the first dump that we took against the third. And in the third, in the first and third, we only change the device password. So the security phrase remains the same. And as you can see, this line here changes between these dumps. And also the encrypted username and password of the first entry changes. So this means actually something good. This means that the encryption is actually dependent on the device password to see that the user set. So an attacker really has to get the device password in order to decrypt it. Next thing we can do is compare it against the first data set that we took. 
And in the next, in the last data set, we actually have the same device password as here on the left, but we changed the security phrase. So here on the right, here on the right, we have a different security phrase as here on the left, but the pet, but the device password is the same. And we see that these two lines change. Previously, when we only change the device password, only this line changes. But in this case, these two lines change. And also the encryption is again different. Now, to be honest, I don't really know how the encryption key is derived from the device password and the security phrase. But if an attacker can figure this out, there is no protection against brute forcing the data that is dumped from this, from this flash. So this means that the user must choose a device password strong enough to withstand an exhaustive key search that is not bound by, by any restrictions. Usually what you would expect in devices such as this is a secure hardware element, for example, a secure memory such as the Atmel AT88SC or some, some other device, which actually restricts the number of tries you have on the encryption key. So there is a hardware element that actually enforces that you only have X number of tries for the passphrase to get it correct and then extract the encryption key. But in this device, the only thing that prevents you from brute forcing is, is that you don't know how the encryption algorithm works. And this is not very good design. And as we have previously seen, the timeout screen that you get, this is only done via software. Unplug the battery, plug it back in, and then you can try as many and as often and as fast as you want. So I will end the video here. I will finish the write-up here on the top so you can read up a little bit more about what is going on with the device. And I will also publish the test data so you can try to figure out how the key derivation process is done and then implement uh, brute force against the device if you like to do that.